Good afternoon. I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's actually the third time I'm here. Uh, not all the way up here, in the bottom here. But uh, we have an hour, so I encourage each one of you to ask me as many questions as you want, free. I don't care that the lecture doesn't go in one direction. No problem. I'd rather answer your questions than just give you a lecture. In case you're going to be mute, as usual, <laughs> so you will hear a lecture. One way or the other, we, go, we have something to talk about. Uh, I understand uh, we're speaking uh, uh, to a second level here, which means it's people who already understand that the Torah is divine. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave the Torah to the Jewish nation 3,321 years ago. Please try to be focused, even though every minute more people coming in. Otherwise, you won't remember anything we spoke about. Just try to focus. From experience, I know when you look at the door or when you eat, you cannot listen. So I say, you know, no problem, I'll talk to the camera. Anyway, so, <laughs> so since it's second level, we don't have to focus on proofs here. I will have to assume that each one of you understand that the Torah is divine. Uh, briefly, in a minute or two, the introduction should be that 3,321 years ago, the Jewish nation had the privilege to stand around the mountain and listen to the voice of God speaking to Moshe. The first two commandments were told in public. When God came to say the third commandment, the Jewish nation just couldn't take it. The, too much pressure. They were uh, under lots of fear and pressure from the event. Imagine, try to imagine everything is shaking, fire, smoke, fog, and uh, the voice of God is coming right there on the mountain. And obviously Chazal explained that their, their, their soul came out of their body. And it's like, like, almost like a clinical death, like out of body experience. And they reach such level that they never ever reach ever again in history. The Torah, the oral Torah, the Gemara explained that uh, every Jewish woman, f a slave, a f you know, a female that really wasn't in a high level, in that particular moment reached a higher level of the Prophet Yechezkel, Ezekiel. And Prophet Yechezkel is one of the most uh, important prophets that we had in history. Even to the Goim, even the Goim follow him, even the Goim follow his prophecies. Some of his prophecies are uh, legendary, which every, almost every person in the world learns about it, even in schools. And he's very famous to the prophecy which we call, which we read in the Yamim Noraim. It's called Chazon Aratzamot Ayeveshot, the, the prophecy of the dry bones. What does it mean? That uh, about six, seven hundred years after the Jewish nation went out of Egypt, the exodus of Egypt, about 40 years before Moshe took the Jewish nation out of, the, or out of Egypt, the tribe of Ephraim escaped. They're able to escape somehow. They made like an overnight uh, uh, running away. And when they reached somewhere in the desert, they were all killed. And there were thousands of bodies dead in a valley. And six, seven hundred years later, I don't have to tell you what happened to bones that they are laying there in a valley. Probably they were eaten by all the animals and only bones were left. But even the bones were very, very dry. They fell apart. It's like one, the head is here, the, the legs are there. I mean, obviously, there's, you cannot see, you cannot identify anyone. And then Hashem took the prophet, Yechezkel, to that place and he said, what do you see? He said, I see all these bones here. And he asked him, is it possible that, that these bones can revive? They can come back to life? And his answer was, you know Hashem. Like, what are you asking me? You know, if you want, they can. It's very interesting because the prophet should have answered every fool, every fool, even a non-believer, if God comes to him. It takes him exactly 10 seconds to realize all my life was a mistake. I wasn't a believer. I didn't know about Hashem. I didn't know anything. Hey, Hashem is speaking to me now. So how long does it take me to become a believer? Ten seconds. Now I know Hashem is there. What's the next step? The next step, he asks me a question. Once he asks me a question, 
What, what in the world I'm going to ask you, I'm going to answer, you know, I'm not sure. What, of course, everything you want can happen. He should have told him, of course, Hashem. He asked him, do you think all these bones can come back to life? He should have said, what's the question? If you want them to come back to life, you bring people to the world from a drop of seed. What is it? A drop of liquid and a person is walking and speaking and remembering and all these things. What's the question? Of course they can come back to life. That's not what he answered. He said, you know. You know. And he said to him, start saying your prophecy. And slowly, slowly, all these bones started to connect together. They started to roll, connects together. And once the bones started to connect, the next step, ligaments started to grow. And then the, the flesh, the skin, everything. And all of a sudden, after a few minutes, thousands of people rise on their legs. And they started to shake all the dust. And they started to talk. Now imagine thousands of people talk, even if they whisper. It's a loud noise. And everyone was surprised. And they came back to life. And this is an integral part of the Tanakh. It's in the Tanakh. The main three religions follow the Tanakh, right? It's close to five billion people in the world. Four billion people. And that happens already. Why the Prophet Yechezkel answered to Hashem, you know? Of course, of course they can come back to life. Because to come back to life, not everybody can come back to life. Here is the place to explain that there is one very important concept in Judaism. If you don't believe in it, if you don't understand it, you won't be able to understand basically anything. You will never come with answer to why righteous people suffer, why wicked people celebrate, why one person is sick, the other person is very healthy, one person is smart, the other one is not so smart. You know, why is a, fem a male and why she is a female? All these things, are, there's billions of questions that we, we don't know why. Why I got married, why he, my friend didn't get married. You know, why all kinds of things happen? We don't know. It's very hard for us to know. We know, generally speaking, how Hashem runs the world, but we don't know specifically why my life is like this, why my friend is like this, why this guy, 28 years old, died in an accident, and his twin brother lived to 100 years old. What's going on here, right? It's hard to understand. The answer to this is that every one person that lives in this world, it's not the first time he's here, and it's a continuation of his previous lives. The soul, the divine soul, that divine energy that God put in our body was here in a different body and was here again before in a different body, sometimes in a male, sometimes in a female, in different parts of the world, different language, different accent, uh, different jobs, different families, different spiritual level. The spiritual level is determined only by the free choice of a person. This world is a place of a test. If God puts you here, you are in a test. If he brought you back again to this world, that means you fail your previous test. If you were already correcting your soul, there's nothing for you to do here. That's not a privilege to sit here and eating pizza and steaks like some people think and go to Florida for, for Pesach, you know, to sit there by, 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 by the lakes over there. That's not, uh, if you think this is the reward of life, then you have no idea what we live for. Everything that you may enjoy in this life, a nice car, a nice watch, a nice suit, a nice wife, whatever you have, it's peanuts compared to the real reward. The real reward is nothing to compare what we have here to what we're going to receive after we finish with this world. But as long as we are here, there is one reason for it. Why? Because we all losers. No offense. All of us, include myself, I'm also here. <laughs> so we are here because we fell in our previous life. If I was successful in my previous life, I wouldn't have to come here. Shabbos, feeling, getting up in the morning, kosher, not kosher, working on my character, lower my ego, and, all, and even the birds came to here, I see. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time I give lecture to birds. <laughs> One time, I'll tell you a quick story. We'll, uh, we'll go back to what we started, but it's interesting. One time, I went to take my car to a car wash. Where is this car wash? If you ever go on Norton Boulevard towards Great Neck, one city before Great Neck, it's Little Neck. There is a car wash over there. It's called Little Neck Car Wash. It's a big sign. You see it on the right side facing Great Neck. I went to wash my car there. I go in. The car goes in and out seven minutes, right? 
So then that night, I had a lecture, Life After Life, proving scientifically that the real life begins in a time of death. Like some people don't know, they have no idea, they're doubting. Scientific proof. Of course, the Torah already spoke about it hundreds of times. But even according to parapsychologists, according to cardiologists, to, sci to all kinds of scientists that deal with that, it can be proven in five minutes that life continues in the time that the soul exits the body. It's obvious, it's already been proven. So I'm speaking to a guy, which is, which is a manager there. He's in charge of the people who works in a car wash. I invite him to the lecture, I give him the address. Then there's another guy from the kibbutz. His name is Amos Efroni, from kibbutz Beta Shita. It's a kibbutz, if you ever buy pickles or olives, Look at that. It says, came from Kibbutz Bet Hashita. That's where he's from. So it's famous Kibbutz in Israel. There's no religion over there, but plenty of olives. <laughs> Maybe they eat too much olives. It makes them forget about Hashem. You know, olive makes you forget. Yeah, unless if you eat it with olive oil. But anyway, so, so what happened is, he listens from the side. He's standing on the side, and he listens. So he comes to me and says, Ah, come on, you really believe in this? This life after life. I say, no. So he said, so how come you give a lecture on something you not believe yourself? I say, I don't believe. I know for sure. He said, why? Oh, anyone came back from there? You know, the famous question. Everybody asks the same questions. There's a million times I heard this. I say, yeah, about 30 million Americans came back from there. You know? Yeah, it's many. So he said to me, really? He started to talk. And in seven minutes that I talked to this guy, today is a big rabbi in Israel. You should see him with his beard, he's in yeshiva in Bnei Brak. That's it, because all he needed is to light the match. The rest, he became a torch and a big fire. So the, the interesting part is that after he started to become religious, I gave him a book of Ramchal, just, a, a Path to the Just. That's the name of it, Mesilat Yesharim. It's a legendary Musar book. After he read that book, that's it. You didn't need to talk to him anymore. He got the point. Then he invited me to speak in his apartment in Upper East Side in Manhattan. He used to be a car wash there. Most of you are young. You probably were little kids when this car wash was destroyed and they made a building over there. And over there, there was a, a four stories building which all kibbutznikim, Israeli from the kibbutz, they all live there. Why it's owned by the owner of the car wash. And they all live there. So he lives there with all his friends. Now they're all very, very anti-religion. Everything smells like Judaism. It's not for them. They're not interested even to hear. Now he comes. They see he reads Mesilat Yisharim. He puts kippah. He's <laughs> trying to make bracha. They went crazy. Amos, don't do this to us. You're our best friend. He said, I want to bring this guy to talk to you. I'm talking to you more than 10 years ago. So he invited me to come, and I went there. There's a little room, and I'm beginning to give a lecture proofs. Now the room is all purple walls, and there are birds. That's how I remember that story, thanks to the birds. But the birds is not like here, behind the wall. The birds flying in the room. <laughs> they have a cage over there, but they fly inside the room. So I give a lecture, a bird attacks me from the right. I go like this. <laughs> then two minutes later, another bird. <laughs> and then in the end, you should have seen the scene that he got up after maybe a few hours that we, we've been talking there. They didn't care to listen. Many people have ears, but they never listen. Why? Because they are not interested to listen. So he told them in the end, you know, all these years I thought you are my best friends and I'm lucky that I have such great friends. But today, in one day, I realize it's all fake. And I can tell each one of you in your face that not only I'm not happy that you are my friends, I'm actually embarrassed. And that was the end of it. And you should see how they were screaming, the girls, Amos, please, you're my best friend, don't do this to us. It's like you're taking him to hell or something. <laughs> how they were crying. That's it. <laughs> you know, when Hashem gave the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu, the Torah in the beginning says like this, Naase Adam betzalmenu kedmutenu. Who understand Hebrew here? No. What does it mean, Naase Adam betzalmenu kedmutenu? It's a little bit hard. Let's make a man in our image, in our essence. 
Very good. Let's make, in plural. Who is God talking to? What does it mean, let's make? Huh? No. Now that's before the creation of the world. It's God saying in plural language, let's make. So when Moshe Rabbeinu wrote this in the Torah, he got stuck. He said to Hashem, hey, why let's make? You should have said, I will make. You're the only God. All these apikorsim, all these anti-religion people, they'll make a party out of this verse. You see, there's more than one God. Here, let's make. He consult with the other gods. How should we make the man? So Hashem answered him. Hashem could have said to him, you're right, that can, that can cause a confusion, but I have my reasons to put it. That's not what he said. What did he answer? He said, just write it. Those who want to make mistake will already make the mistake. Now, I don't understand. Do you know about a person who is interested to make mistakes? We're making mistakes not intentionally. We're not choosing our mistake. Something that we choose to do, it's not a mistake. It's a choice. You want to kill someone. If you killed him by mistake, you didn't see him, the ladder fell on his head, that's a mistake, that's an accident. But if you shot at him, you say, no, it's a mistake. Yeah, I, really, I didn't really mean. I just shot at him, I was angry a little bit. So, you know, I, wasn't, I, I was hoping that the bullet won't hit his head. What, what is this? This is an intentional murder. So what does it mean someone who wants to make a mistake will make the mistake? This is the answer of God. First, who did God speak to? To the angels. Why does he speak to the angels? Even though the angels are robots, they do exactly what God commanded them to do. He gives them credit like they participate in the creation of Adam. One angel is in charge of iron. One angel is in charge of water. One angel is, uh, angel is in charge of fire. This is all the ingredients of man's body. Even though the body of a person is $2 in a chemical lab. If you go to buy the minerals that we have in our body, if you take the body of a person after he dies and break it to minerals and all kinds of chemical, whatever we have, it's about $2, less than a slice of pizza. Everybody understands that a person is worth a lot. Nobody sue for $2, right? The lawyer alone, as soon as he says, hello, yes, how can I help you? $300 on the way to you. <laughs> the bill. <laughs> you know, the one guy called the lawyer. He said, excuse me, Mr. Attorney, uh, they said that you are, you're charging $300 for three questions over the phone, right? So the lawyer said, yes, no, what's the problem? He said, don't you think it's too expensive? He said, maybe, what's your third question? <laughs> <laughs> Who are God already? You know? so, so anyway, so this we, we learn from here something very interesting, really interesting. That if a person wants to make mistake when it comes to religion, he will find how to make mistake. It's a free choice. Nobody makes mistakes not intentionally. They choose not to do the right thing because it's not convenient for them. They don't want to get up in the morning. They don't want to dress in a certain way. They don't want to eat limited food, only this and not that. They don't want uh, to do all kinds of things that the Torah forbid. Since they already made up their mind that they are not interested to live like a righteous human being, every day they'll find another excuse. The excuses will never end. One guy left the yeshiva. It was about 40 years ago, the story. 40 years ago, and uh, after he left the yeshiva, slowly, slowly, he started to become more and more secular. That after a year or so, he was already mechalel Shabbat. He's not keeping Shabbat, smoking on Shabbat. Obviously, people who smoke in Israel 40 years ago on Shabbat, they were hiding. It's not like today, nobody cares anymore. Ah, or you tell me what to do. The first mechalel Shabbat, 50, 60 years ago, they went to the orchards to smoke and came back. Why are they embarrassed from the religious people, from the rabbis, from the people, from the parents, from the uncle? They were embarrassed. So one, he was, he was walking on the street and all the people are coming out of the synagogue. And the rabbi and all the students, which were all from his yeshiva. A year ago, he was still learning with them. He saw the rabbi from far away, so he threw the cigarette right away. He was embarrassed. From the rabbi, he's embarrassed. From Hashem, he's not so embarrassed. 
So, as he walked towards the rabbi, now he doesn't know if the rabbi saw him or not. He's nervous. So he said, let's check. He said, hi, rabbi, Shabbat Shalom, good Shabbos, yeah. Rabbi, I have a question that bothers me very much. And the rabbi said, yeah, what's that question? So he asked some kind of question from the Gemara. And the rabbi said, you're right, I don't have the answer. Then he asked another question. And the rabbi said, you're right, I don't have the answer. Then he asked another question. The rabbi said, wow, today you got me. I don't know any one of the answers. So he told him, rabbi, don't fool me. I've been learning with you for years. I never heard you not giving an answer to any question. You know everything. Why don't you want to answer me? So he told him, I have the answers to real questions, not to excuses. You already made up your mind. Now every answer I'll give you, you come up with another question. You think I'm a fool? What do you think? I was born today. You already made up your mind, you want to be Haman, you want to be Eichmann, whatever you want to be. You want to do whatever you want. You want to kill, you want to be Mechalel Shabbat, you want to make scenes, you want to eat whatever you want, fine. It's up to you, you're, it's your choice. Now to relax your conscience, you're going to come up with some questions like supposedly I don't have the answer to make you feel good. And that's what it is. So let's go back to what we started. So the Prophet told... The Prophet told Hashem, you know if these bones can come back to life. You know. Why? Who can tell me why the Prophet didn't say to Hashem, of course Hashem, if you want, they'll come back to life. And if you don't want, they won't. Why the Prophet say, I don't know, you know. Who knows why? Why that was the answer of the Prophet? Yes. They already made up their mind. The people who died? No, but the people who died were not wicked people. All their sin was that they escaped out of slavery. It's perfectly legit. But they got killed. They go and kill them. Whatever happened, they die out, out of starvation. But they died. Now, once they died, Hashem asked the Prophet, do you think they can come back to life? And the Prophet said, I'm not, I don't know. if You know. You know if they can come back to life. I would answer, of course, what's the question? If you want, in one minute they'll be standing and speaking, right? That's everyone would answer to God, Jew, Goy, everyone. But the Prophet didn't say that. The Prophet said, you know, the answer is, listen good, it applies to us. When a person died, what do you think, automatically is being reincarnated in another body for another chance? No. You need a merit for it. Many people do not come back in Gilgul, in reincarnation. Why? They don't have the merit. I don't want to tell you where they go. I don't want to ruin your Sunday afternoon, especially before the food that they serve here today, I heard. <laughs> so I don't want to ruin your afternoon. If you but if you search for the truth, I'll tell you where to find it. Yeah? But the people who comes back here, how God decide to which family they are going to be born? Why you are born in Brooklyn and your friend was born in Israel and your other friend was born in Japan? Why your parents are X and Y and his parents is A and B? Why you are a male and she is a female? Why you are born healthy and your other friend is hardly walking? Why are you so smart and your friend doesn't even remember what's his name? Why is it? Why you are very generous and all your friends are so stingy, they don't give a dollar away. And you suffer so much when you go out, you always have to pay for them. You ask yourself all these questions. Why my parents are poor and their parents are rich? Why this? Why that? Many millions of questions. The answer is, where you left the world, that's when you go back to continue. It's no coincidence. I give you an example. If you are 45 years old and you're not married, you ask yourself, if you are a wicked person, you're making all kinds of sins and violations and go against God, then don't be surprised. He's not, he doesn't owe you anything. You go against him, you're ungrateful to him, why should he give you a spouse? That makes sense, measure for measure. I'm talking now someone who's a tzaddik. A girl, she learns Torah, she's modest, she keeps Shabbos, she prays to Hashem with tears, she's uh, very close to Hashem. 40, 41, 45, and she never got married, or he never got married. So they're wondering, what, what, what did I do that I deserve this kind of fortune? The answer is, let's do rewind in her film, 
30, let's rewind the story, 60 years reverse. What is it? Now we are in 2011, let's say, so, so, so 1950, you know, the year, you know, 60 years ago. Oh, what do we see? A girl in Germany, in Poland, can be in Syria, can be in Iran, can be, Jews lived everywhere. What is she? She's a married woman. What did she do? Disrespect her husband, abuse him, do bad things, not a good wife, not a good mother, abuse the children, making a lot of problems. Such an evil woman, in one second, everybody understands why she's 45, not married. Now she doesn't see anything. If she had permission to see her previous life, she say, oh God, I'm so ashamed. Thank you, thank you that I never got married. At least I'm paying for my sins. At least I cleanse my soul. That's the way it is, right? You make me now pay here, fine, I accept it. The man is not married. He's 50 years old. You go back to his previous life. You see that he, he already got divorced four times. And every one of his wife left the marriage with broken bones. Amevin yavin. Somebody like this deserves to get married? No. Now, by, by us looking at him, we are thinking, what a poor guy. Look how much he suffers. In one second film that we see who he used to be, they say, thank you, God, you're so righteous. Everything changed by understanding how it works. Yes. First of all, the people who are reincarnated, most likely they did not make tshuva. If they would make tshuva, they'd go to heaven already. They wouldn't be here. Remember, you were here when I said that all of us here because we are losers? Someone who made tshuva is definitely not a loser. He's a big winner. Making tshuva means I took all the money I owe Con Con Edison. I owe the millions of dollars for not paying 20 years. And I reached an agreement. It's wiped out of my file. Imagine you didn't pay electric for 20 years. The whole neighborhood gets electric thanks to you for free. You found out they made a mistake. They're not sending you bills. One year, two years, no bills. The neighbor's cable from your window is to all over the Brooklyn. Half of Brooklyn already get electric from your apartment. Why? Because it's free. One day, the electric company, by mistake, realized that you already owe $25 million. <laughs> Call you right away for a meeting, emergency meeting. They send few muscular bodyguards to make sure you show up. And then they say to you, listen, we give you 24 hours to pay $25 million, or if not, right away we have connection, you get arrested, who knows what's gonna be with you. So imagine you come to the electric company and say to them, let's make a deal. Let's forget what I owe you, and from tomorrow I start paying my electric bill. <laughs> <laughs> what would happen to you? The 24 hours that they gave you to pay the money would become five minutes. You get arrested right away for your chutzpah. <laughs> but with Hashem it works. With Hashem it works. You say, okay, Hashem, let's start fresh. I owe you a lot. From now on, I don't do it. I regret. I'm ashamed. I never repeat it. I ask you to forgive me. I do vidu every day. Comes Yom Kippur. And one day I die. That's it. I'm done with my sins. If you have to come back to life, that means you're not done with your sin. Either you did not make tshuva, or you made a partial tshuva. It's better than nothing, but it's not enough. Hey, what's up, though, for this? If, if people don't come back to life, you said that most people don't get down. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I tell you what, I don't want to get to such level, because I'm not sure that uh, you can handle the truth at this moment. But, uh, yeah, because not everyone can handle the truth. Uh, the, food, the food was only an excuse, you know that. So the point is, look, let's, listen. I, I, let's, let me give you a hint. There are two ways to clean your shirt. One, to do it on your own and sweat eight hours until the stain come out. And second is you give it to the dry clean. Now take your soul. The soul of every Jew is contaminated with spiritual stain. Now, when you're still alive and you have a free choice, you are able to clean the stain by yourself with no pain. Yes, that's effort. You have to work very hard. You have to learn Torah. You have to daven. You have to do many things. But, but, shh, 
I know keep, people are still coming. Try not to, not to look in the, at the door. So, you can correct it while you're still alive. After you died, this is my answer to you, God will clean your soul for you. And it's not going to be pleasant. That's all I can say. Unless, if He gives you another chance to be reincarnated. If He sends you back to the world, then man, you can do it on your own. I never claimed that to be reincarnated is a picnic. How much problems we have in life? Agony, pain, loneliness, poverty, uh, abuse, parents' problems, violence, school problems. If you hear the amount of messages I get every day from people's tragedy, just on my way here, two hours ride from Muncie to Brooklyn, three tragedies. One guy, 28 years old, accident, coma, two days dead. Another guy, age 20, cancer, in the middle of the surgery, they cleaned the cancer, but they made a hole in his lung by mistake. Went to coma, had to fly him to Israel, forget about it. Just on the way here, so many tragedies. Life is full of pain, full of pain. It's not easy to correct here. Even if we send back to another life, we have to start from zero. But if we were generous, that means in our previous life we get a lot of donation, a lot of tzedakah. We are born generous again. Why? Because we corrected that already. If we are stingy, we are born stingy again. Why? We have to correct that. We never corrected that. If we are angry people, we are born with anger. You see the little kids, how they scream? And some of them are very quiet. Some are very angry. Some are very calm down. You take away the pretzel, <laughs> they go and cry in the corner. The other one, if you have a little hair left on your head, it's gone. If it's in a supermarket, he roll ten aisles. He embarrass you, make sure you give him what he wants. Why? That's how he died. Four years ago, he was a 75 years old man. And when, no, when his kids or grandkids did not do what he want, he make sure they'll give it to him. I'll, I'll tell you an a funny story. One guy, one guy said, you know, I have my... Uh, I have my children, and I have, I, I have about $3 million. Why should I give my money to my children after I die? Let me be a smart father. I'll give them the money while I'm still alive. At least I see how my children and grandchildren enjoy my money in my life, no? Wow, what good is that for me? I'll be in a grave already, and they finally enjoy my money. Let me enjoy with them. Smart, no? Not so smart. <laughs> well, it depends who your children are. <laughs> you know, one guy came to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, Rabbi, when I die, make sure you bury me with a warm coat and $5 in my pocket. The rabbi is saying, all my life I never heard such a request. <laughs> you care about the coat and $5 in your pocket in your grave? So, Rabbi, we are believers. No, Jews know that one day it's going to be the resurrection of the dead. What happens if it happens in December? I'm buried here in New York, December, I get up, I don't have a coat. <laughs> so the rabbi said, oh, I understand. But why the five dollars? He said, I know my children, they won't give me a warm coat and, and a cup of coffee. So I want to have at least five dollars that I can go to Dunkin' Donuts and get coffee. <laughs> so the rabbi told him, my friend, I have bad news for you. <laughs> if this is the children you left in this world that they won't supply you with a coat and a cup of coffee, you won't resurrect in the resurrection of the day. You had me for sure you fell in your life. <laughs> if this is the children you left here, you understand? That they won't care about their father to give him a cup of coffee in a freezing day. So this old man decided to give his millions away. He gave it to his three sons. Two weeks after, they forgot that they have a father. No invitation for Shabbos, no phone calls, no nothing. He's lonely in his apartment. Soon he's not going to have enough to pay the expenses. He said, well, the children forgot about me. He came to the rabbi. He said, rabbi, help me out here. I, now apparently I made a big mistake. The rabbi told him, you fool. Didn't you read the words of Chazal that a person should not give his wealth to his children in his life? Only before he leaves the world. He said, no, rabbi, I didn't know. I'm not a rabbi. I didn't know. He said, don't worry, I'll get you out of it. Tomorrow morning, call up your son, tell him you need him to come with his car and to take you to the locksmith store, you want to buy a big safe. So your son is going to ask you, hey, dad, why do you want, 
Why do you want a safe for? Safe from there. So you tell him all my precious jewels, the rubies, the diamonds, I never gave it out yet. And they're all in different safes in banks. I'm afraid that one day if I die, you won't know where to find them. I want to be able to install a safe in my bedroom that when I die, all you have to do is come, I'll give you the password, you open the safe, and you, you, know, you sell the diamonds and the rubies, and you have another few million dollars, you and your brothers. So the brothers say, Father, tomorrow 9 o'clock I'm coming with my van, don't worry, we'll get the safe. The two other brothers didn't want to miss the opportunity, so all three of them showed up. So they go to the locksmith, they even pay for the safe, the generous brothers. <laughs> so they bring the safe, they install it in his bedroom, finished. I don't have to tell you that in the next seven years his life was paradise. Every week they fight where he's going to eat by Shabbos. Who's going to take him, who's going to drive him to the doctor, who's going to change his diapers. They're fighting. <laughs> They're fighting. One day he died. They all come. A minute after he died, all three of them met where? By the bedroom. <laughs> they come, the lawyer is there. They take a video camera to make sure there's no mistake. They open, ta 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 ta, <laughs> they open the safe. What do they see? Some regular stones from the street, some mud, sand, and a piece <laughs> of paper. <laughs> this is what children who betray their father deserve to get. <laughs> Smart. Oh? The rabbi got him out. <laughs> he thought to be a good father. What did he know that he has uh, ungrateful children like this? This is what Hashem tells us. I give you so much and you forgot about me. I give you so much and you keep forgetting about me. The more I give you, instead of appreciate me and be grateful to me, what do you do? You take what I gave you and use it against me. I give you legs, you walk to places you're not allowed. I give you hands, you do bad things with them. I give you eyes, you look at things you're not supposed to. I give you a brain, you only think about bad things all day. <laughs> I give you mouth, you fresh like a pig all day. What, what's going on? Finally, you're able to talk, 99% of what comes out of your mouth is nonsense. You saw that movie, you saw that dress, you saw that diamond that she bought, I'm so jealous, I'll talk to my husband, they went on vacation, why we do not go, they bought a car, why we don't have the same car, we have to make a scratch on her car, I can't let her enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, one guy, his father came to him and said, listen, listen, I'll make a deal with you. Whatever you want me to give you, I'll give you. But you should know that whatever you request from me, I'll give your brother double. So he told him, okay, take one eye of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Which means take the two eyes to him. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> this is called Tsar Ein. His eye, in Hebrew, you don't have that in expression in English. It's a narrow eye. Why narrow? If it's open wide, then it shows you generous, you're okay, you're happy that people have. But some people, he can have a hundred million dollars in his bank account and his cousin finally made his first thousand dollars in business after ten years of frustration. And his wife, Moshe, what happened? You're rolling all night in bed. It eats me up. Well, how he made that deal and not me? Thousand dollars, yeah, hundred million dollars, he make more interest an hour than what the guy made. And it kills him. And you think it's an exaggeration? You have no idea how many people like this out there. They, they have everything. And they find somebody had a, once in his life a good deal, it kills them. It bothers them. Oh, good. So I see you're doing good. Two hours later, the deal is off. Ainara, evil eye. Let's see what Hashem has to tell each one of us. This is, I'm reading to you a few verses from the Torah to shake us up a little bit. First, Mi iten ve'aya ze levavam le'ira oti kol ayamim. Translation, I wish, who's speaking? Everything I say now is Hashem speaking. I wish that their heart, will, they will be clever to fear me all their life. If they fear me, they'll do the right thing. 
Same thing like a police. If a police is on a highway, you drive slow. If they go on a, scri on a strike, what happened on a highway? It's missiles, not car. <laughs> right? Then, then, Vasita Ayashar Veatov Beine Hashem. You should do what's straight and decent in the eyes of God, not in your eyes. Many people tell me, I am religious in my way. Ani dati baderech sheli. I'm religious in my way. It's like saying, I'm Chinese in my way. <laughs> so you're Chinese in your way. You either Chinese or you're not Chinese. You a Jew or you're not Jew. I feel Jewish, Rabbi. But your mother is not Jewish. But it's okay, I feel in my heart I'm Jewish. You, may, you have a major disappointment when you die. You're not going to the Jewish world. Yeah, I feel Jewish. <laughs> my husband is Jewish. We keep Yom Kippur. <laughs> you know, when I got my uh, citizenship, first I had a green card, and then I had to go on an interview. When was the interview? Three, four hours before Yom Kippur started. Erev Yom Kippur. I say to myself, what a bad luck. Three, four hours before the fast, everyone is busy with tshuva. I have to go to downtown Manhattan, millions of all kinds of international faces. That's what I have to spend my Erev Yom Kippur. What can I do? You wait years for this citizenship. It's either now or never. You wait another 10 years now. So I go there. They call my name. Interview. So the woman is an American, Puerto Rican, half black, half white woman. <laughs> she looks at me. She says, oh, Mizrahi. Jewish. Psh, listen, you and I have something to do in a few hours, huh? She said, <laughs> I said, me, yes, but why you? He said, my husband is Jewish. I got to go prepare food. No, the fast begins. We don't have time for questions. Mazal tov. <laughs> I was worried. Questions, interview, what? Nothing. Tak, 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 finish. <laughs> Yeah, you never know. Then, then the Torah continues. Listen, I'm reading you key verses from the Torah. Hashem said like this, Chazku alai divrechem. Translation, I'm sick and tired from your nonsense, the things that you speak. Amar Hashem, says Hashem. And you're going to say, Why? What did we say so bad? that you are so upset at us. Who is speaking? The Jews. The answer, what? What is it worth for us to serve God? To follow Him and to keep His commandments? You understand? This is what people say. What's the point, Rabbi? I'm religious 40 years. I still don't make a, even one million. My friend is Mechalel Shabbat. He's successful. Everything he touches becomes gold. If there is no Gilgulim, if there's no continuation, then you have a very good point. Then there's no justice. You're right. But if the Torah told you that this life is a blink of the eye, oh, it's over. And the next life is eternity. You know what it means eternity? A trillion years is not even the beginning. And the Torah says something, I hope you'll be clever enough just to remember that from this lecture. It's enough. One sentence, not the whole lecture. This, the Torah says, if you're going to listen to me and follow my mitzvot, even though today it's very hard to see what's going on out there, it's like a zoo, the world is a zoo. The streets of Brooklyn, it's like a beach. It's no difference. People have no faith, no emunah, no yamaka, no irat shamayim, no modesty, no integrity. Everyone is lying, everyone is cheating, everyone buries each other for money, for fame, for glory. Parents, problem, broken family. Oof, the list is all the way from here to Japan. It's very hard to be a servant of Hashem. It's very difficult. My rabbi, all my friends will see me with the yamaka. Just two weeks ago, I was in a club with them. I'm going to come like this now. They're all going to make fun at me. You want me to marry separate? 
Men here, women there, come on, Rabbi, it's not realistic. My family, my father paid for the wedding, he won't pay. How will I do it? There's a lot of challenges. But this is what the Torah says. The Torah says, if you keep my mitzvot and follow my ways, I will reward you in your end. When the story in this world will end, that's when the reward will start. Or God forbid, the punishment, depend who you are. You chose what to be. The free choice, the Rambam writes, and the Torah says, it's 100% in a person's hand. If he wants to be Moshe Rabbeinu, he has the opportunity to be. If he wants to be a Rovan ben Navad, the worst wicked kid, he can, the king, he could be. It's 100% in your hands. So the Torah says like this. If you take all the reward of all the people, from the beginning of the world to the end of the world, Every person who ever lived here, money, wealth, sport, women, hobbies, vacation, food, you name it, combine everything into one huge mountain of pleasure, of not one or two people. Today alone we have seven billion people in the world. And this is only this generation. Go back 5,700 years, there's hundreds of generations, there's probably who knows how many billions of people hundreds of billions of people, combine all the pleasure together, will not be equal to the pleasure of one righteous Jew in the next life for one hour. Do you understand what I just said here? That's enough for every clever Jew to put all his nonsense from his life on the side and focus on a very productive mission with a guarantee signature. It's not the signature of your boss. Maybe the check will clear, maybe not. Maybe the landlord will change the, the electric or the fixture in your house, or maybe not. Maybe they fix the elevator, maybe not. Maybe the surgery will save you, maybe not. Everything is maybe in our life, but with Hashem is certain. I am the faithful God who paid my lover's reward for thousand generations. I don't want to continue the verse to those who doesn't follow his way. Use your imagination. It's all free choice. What does it mean, free choice? Free choice means if you are an animal, you live with instinct. You don't choose what to do. You live based on the situation. There's fire, you run away. There's water, you jump in. If you are a tiger and you're hungry and you see a zebra walking, what do you do? Nobody told you, hey, Mr. Lion, attack. You're hungry. You attack. Now imagine the photographers are taking pictures of the zebra. They say, hey, excuse me, Mr. Lion, wait three minutes. We almost finished. We came all the way from Israel to Africa. Give us three more minutes before you attack. There's no way to stop him. A lion is a lion. He lives with instinct. But a person, you can say, well, wait, Moshe, before you murder, three more minutes, let us fi finish the picture. Then you kill him. Not now. Three more minutes. Okay, three minutes. Okay. No problem. I can wait. Why? Free choice. You know how the GPS work in a car? I'm not talking the ones where you put Jerusalem and you find yourself in Gaza. <laughs> not this kind of GPS. <laughs> I was going from the north of Israel to Tel Aviv. So I, you know, I put on a GPS. They change all the roads. It's hard to know. All of a sudden, it comes to Baka El Garbia the center of all these terrorists over there, make a left, he says. <laughs> I see a sign, Baka El Garbiya. I said, maybe there's a shortcut here, but I don't want to, <laughs> shortcut to hell, Ulai. <laughs> so I say, you know what, let's go straight, forget about this. Then after three, four miles, again, make a left. Again to Baka El Garbiya. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I don't know, maybe the Arab messed up the GPS, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, the, the way the GPS work is exactly like our life. If you know that device, you know how the free choice works. Let me explain. Now you have to go from here to Monsi. So you have to go to uh, BQE, and then you go to the Tribal, and then to George, I mean, to George Washington Bridge, and then you take Palisades, you go north. You have a few highways that you... What happens if you miss the exit? It's heavy traffic, trucks. There, this was your exit. You didn't pay attention. Oh, you just passed the exit. By five feet, there's no way to go reverse. It's bumper to bumper. What's going to happen to you now? In one hour, you have a, a billionaire businessman that is waiting for you to close a very important deal. 
he has a flight to catch and he's leaving at 5 o'clock. He, you have to meet him at 2. It's going to take half an hour. He goes back to his country and you are a rich man. Now he's stuck in traffic. It took you an hour until you were able to make a U-turn and go back to the exit. And by the time you got to Monsi, he already took the cab. He's already on the way to Japan. And you're going to be poor for the rest of your life. For what? Mistake of one second. It affected your whole future. How does it work in life? You are 20 years old now. One rabbi came to you and invited you to a lecture. Sunday afternoon, 3.30. Now you're sitting at 3 o'clock in your house, and you're thinking to yourself, should I go there or not? Should I go there? They make a party to my mother. They serve a cake. What's more important now? That I go and listen to the words of God? Or maybe I go and eat pizza with my cousins and, you know, you know watch something over there? Do you have, a, do you have a, a doubt what to do? You chose to come to the lecture. Your friend chose to go to the party. That's it. That's a free choice. Nobody told you what to do. You came to the lecture, you listened to one hour, some of the words got into your head, then you took a DVD, you watched it, it makes you even stronger, you went to the website, you started to listen to lectures. A month later, you Shomer Shabbat, then you went to yeshiva for six months, or Sameach, Kol Yaakov, Reisha Torah, there's a lot of good yeshivot. Six months later, you already know a lot of Torah. You have Yamaka, you have Tzitzit, now you became a different person. You don't steal anymore, you don't cheat, you don't lie, you watch your eyes. Another six months later, they give you a beautiful, righteous girl. She's also made tshuva. You got married. Ten years later, you have five children. They go to Talmud Torah. Twenty years later, one of your children become Rav Yashiv or Rav Ovadia Yosef, the chief rabbi of the world. What made you the father of this rabbi today? May, what is it? May 5th today? May 5th? May, May 8th, whatever it is. May, May, May 3.30 in the afternoon. One minute decision. Your friend that went to the party and ate a lot of cream cake full of margarine. <laughs> 20 years later, where is he? He owned a club in Manhattan. Every day, a thousand Jews make sins because of that decision 20 years ago. That's how the GPS works, that's how life works. They give you two girls, very beautiful, but not righteous. Not so beautiful, but very righteous. A lover of Hashem. Integrity, modesty, will be a great mother. All the skills. What? She's not Miss Universe. The other one, very impressive. It's a real show off. A lot of attention. But your kids will go with their jeans all the way down on the street in 10 years. <laughs> Why? You chose the wrong woman. So what's going to happen? The choice today determines your eternity. In a thousand years from now, who's your grand, 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 grandson? It's today's decision, like the GPS. You made the wrong turn, everything in the future changed in a second. Recalculate. This is how, that's how Hashem is doing by us. It's all recalculating. You came to the lecture. You volunteered to the community. You help Rach to bring more people to the lecture. You come, you help, you bring chairs. I don't know. I, I don't know really how many volunteer works they ask you to do here. But you do. And you help to make one Jew religious. Your future will never be the same. 20, 30, 50 years later, you're going to see the impact of what you do every second of your life. That's called 100% free choice. The, the animals don't have it. Jews have it. The thought of a Jew is making a great impact in heaven. If it's good, for the positive. If it's bad, for the negative. But remember, the, the Torah says, If I would not take care of my soul, nobody will do the job for me. No one. You count on your children to save you. Maybe they'll be able to help, most likely not. You think your wife's going to save you? Yeah, she can help a little bit, but it's 100% in your hand. When you go to Israel, sometimes the suitcase arrives to Tel Aviv, sometimes they arrive to Moscow. You don't know. You want to have your tefillin tomorrow morning for Shachris? You carry it on you. If I'll be alive tomorrow morning, the tefillin will be with me. Why? Imen anili mili. If I will not take care of myself, nobody will. Since time is running out, I will finish with one story. And then if you have questions, feel free to ask. 
just for us to understand how the Ashgacha works. There was a Jew, his name was Pinchas Bradwin. That's a true story, it happened in Israel. And there was a family that every baby is born to them, right away after a few days died. He has some kind of sickness in his blood. Nobody knew what it is. The doctor, specialist, you know, we're talking primitive generation, maybe 30, 40 years ago this story or more, and nobody knows why. After about five kids that died to them, they're asking themselves, what's the point? The woman's poor woman, she carried a baby nine months, and in the end, nothing happens. So, one time a doctor from overseas was visiting in Israel, and accidentally, you know, nothing is accident, it's all supervised by Hashem, he heard that there, there is that family that having this problem. Now, this is a world expert in blood, in blood. So he's thinking to himself, listen, I'm already here. I would like to go and speak to this family. So the doctor went there and he told them, do, can you do me a favor? I want to take your blood sample and your husband's blood sample. I want to check. Maybe I will find out what's the reason for the death. So he took it. He went back to America, whatever. And then he came back after a few weeks and he knew that what's the, what's the problem with the blood type of the husband and the wife? So he sent them a letter and he told them, you need a person with this blood type to give you blood for the mother. And before you give birth, you have to change the entire blood in your body. And then when the baby is born in the beginning, in those few days, he's going to get the right blood and then he survive. Something like that. I don't know exactly 100% the details, but you got the point. So they were searching for a person in Israel that have this kind of blood. And they found this person, his name is Pinchas Bredwin. And he agreed to donate blood. He was a religious man from Yerushalayim. So he came, he gave blood. And that was the end of it. Twenty years later, Pinchas Bredwin, his daughter, is going on a shiduch. Who did she marry? The boy that was born from his blood. <laughs> now, this is, this is Pinchas Bradwin. We don't know him because it was before we were born. But I had a story with me. A few years ago, I went to give a lecture in Queens. I'm connecting my laptop, my projector. And the last time I was in that place, there was a girl with a Russian background. Her parents came from Russia when she was a little girl. And she came to me in the previous lecture, now she's 20 years old, she's very religious, and she wants a Ben Torah, she wants someone who's learning Torah. So she tells me, hey, you're from Mansi, from the yeshiva, maybe you find me someone that is learning serious, because I'm interested to get married to a serious learner. So I said, okay, write your information down, and hopefully I'll have someone in mind, I'll let you know. Three months later, I came back to the same place, and the husband and wife who arranged the event, uh, they speak to me now while I'm connecting my wires there. And she said, well, my friend is apologizing that she couldn't come, but she just got married, that's why. I said, oh, very nice. Baruch Hashem, she doesn't need my help. She got married already. Then she asked me, do you know how she got married? <laughs> if you hear such thing, what the, you become very curious, no? Now, I'm about to start the lecture. I have about a hundred secular guys and girls, all of them not Shomer Shabbat, ready for lecture of proofs, Torah and science. And it's in about two or three minutes I'm ready to start. While I'm preparing, she's telling me the story and everyone is listening. She say when she came to America, she was a little girl, her parents were so poor, they couldn't put her in yeshiva. So there is an organization that collects money for Rush Russian Jews, and put them in yeshivot instead of public school. And they collect, they get sponsors. So they went to a rich guy. He's not religious. Russian, not religious. They told him that this girl, either she go to public and who knows if she stayed Jewish one day, or we put her in yeshiva and you save a family, you save a soul. Do you want to sponsor her? The guy was a good man. He said, fine, I'll sponsor her. End of story, now she goes to yeshiva. <laughs> Needless to say that she was so poor, she could never afford to buy even candy. 
No money for the bus. Not one time she had a quarter in her pocket. This is the way she described it, this girl. She's a very poor girl. Everybody knows. Everyone feels bad for her. Okay. Now she became 20 years old. She went to a place, some library or something. She, she writes some articles. And one not religious Jewish girl comes to her. Hi, nice to meet you. You're religious? Yes, I see. Yeah, your dress, very nice. So she said to her, I think I have a shidduch for you. I can find you someone to get married. So she looks at her, she says, yeah. She says, my brother. She says, no, I think you got it wrong. I'm interested in a very religious guy. Well, you're not religious. Who's your brother? So she tells her, no, no, don't worry. My brother is very religious. He's a bad tshuva. He just went to Or Sameach in Monsi for six months. And he came back like fire. And he wants very religious girl. He doesn't want to go on any date. Only very religious girl. What do you have to lose? I think you can make a perfect match. Of course, they went out a few times. Perfect. Now the parents have to meet each other. So this girl, she's taking her parents to meet the parents of the guy. Who was the father of the guy? The one who paid for almost 16 years her tuition to send her to yeshiva. Seven billion people in the world. Hashem told him, you think you're doing for somebody else? You do it for yourself. Every tzedakah, every chesed you do for others is 100% for yourself. Nothing for him. Hashem would save him with or without you. You think he depend on you to save him? You think he depend on you to buy him food for the holiday? He would get him the food. Now it's the free choice who wants to be the volunteer to do it. You do it. You get a million, spiritual million dollar for the next world ready for you. And when you need help, what you did for him will come back to you. This is the way it works. Same thing mentioning Or Sameach. There was a guy there named Dave. You heard that story? Just for that, it was worth it for you to come. This guy, Dave, somehow ended up in Or Sameach and he's not even Shomer Shabbos. After a few weeks, he's learning Torah, 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 Gemara. He became Shomer Shabbat. Then, after a month or two, it's very difficult for him to learn. So he come to the Rosh Yeshiva. I say, Rabbi, I cannot stay here. I got to go back to my parents. I don't know, Pittsburgh, somewhere, Michigan. They live somewhere. There's no Judaism there, nothing. So he, tell to, he tells the Rabbi, but don't worry, Rabbi. I'm going to stay religious. The rabbi told him, you're not ready. You just started. One or two weeks over there, you collapse. What do you think? You need a backup. Rabbi, it's too much for me to learn all day. I'm not capable of learning. No matter what they did, he took his bag and went home. First Shabbat, the influence of the yeshiva is still in his head. So he kept the first Shabbat. Second Shabbat, all week, he's thinking, should I keep it? Should I not? I'm by myself here. There's no synagogue. What am I going to do? So Friday afternoon arrived. 12 o'clock in the afternoon, he say, Hashem, if you are interested that I will keep Shabbat like the rabbis told me in Yeshiva, you have between now and Shabbat to give me a sign. You give me a sign, I'll keep Shabbat. You don't give me a sign, that's it. I'm done with that. Eight o'clock in the evening arrived, Shabbat started, no sign. But he still cannot violate Shabbat. He's still thinking, should I, should I not? He said, okay, I'm giving you a second chance. Don't say I wasn't fair with you. <laughs> By midnight, 12 o'clock, if you give me a sign, I will stay Shomer Shabbat for the rest of my life. It's worth it for you. You don't give me a sign. That's it. I'm turning the television on. Finished. Midnight arrived. What do you think? You got a sign or no? No. No, no sign. But still, his heart is burning. He's holding the remote like this. So you know what? One last chance, but that's it. 15 more minutes. 12.15, you don't give me a sign, I turn the television on, I'm done with this, that's it. 12.15 arrived, what do you think happened now? No, no sign. He turned the television on. What's going on now on the television? The Dave Letterman show. <laughs> you see Dave Letterman. Dave Letterman interview a Jew that just came back from Israel, he's somebody in Hollywood, this Jew. And he speaks to this Jew, and he said to that Jew, so what are you doing these days? So that Jew says to him, oh, actually, I just came back from Israel. 
So he said, oh, really? Can you say something in Hebrew? So he said to him, Shabbat Shalom, Dave. <laughs> and the guy who turned the television on, his name is Dave. <laughs> as soon as he turned the television on, five seconds, the, the camera on his face, Shabbat Shalom, Dave. <laughs> I don't know what was the merit of this guy that Hashem gave him such a clear miracle in a match like this. Not always we get it, but we get plenty of our own miracles. If you run a diary and you write all the miracles that God does to you every day and watch, and watch it once, once in a while, you open and read it, you'll be amazed how many things God is doing for you. The problem is that we all have short memory. We don't even remember what we ate for breakfast. And we forget all the miracles that Hashem does for us. But if we're going to be a little bit more consistent, we'll feel ungrateful to go against the Torah. Every time you do a violation, you're going to feel lousy. Why? You give me oxygen. You give me energy. You give me food. You give me a house. You give me a bed. You give me a car. You give me whatever you gave me. And I'm using it against you? What kind of son it is? And right away, this is the way the heart begins to make tshuva. Now remember, the fact that we don't get an immediate response from Hashem for good or for bad is because He does not want to eliminate our free choice. If everyone will get his punishment right away, or his reward right away, then there's no, it's not going to be any free choice. Every person who violated Shabbat, God forbid, something happened to him right away, of course nobody will violate Shabbat. Who wants to, to die or to get hurt? Who wants to do something? What kind of way? There's no free choice. Shabbat comes. Moshe, where are you? Shh. Shabbat started. Come here. No, no, I don't want to move. So two people violate Shabbat, something happened. I don't take risks. What kind of a test is this? Of course, even Arafat will be Shomer Shabbat. <laughs> Why? He saw a few Jews did something. He doesn't want to take a risk. Or if a person put $100 in a tzedakah box, and a minute later he has 200 bucks came to his pocket. Then he put the 200, 400 came back. The best bank in the world. All the goyim would come around the yeshiva and throw all their money inside. <laughs> Why? Well, right away, they doubled their money. What kind, of, what kind of a test is this? The test is, you gave $1,000 to tzedakah, the next day you lost a deal. You just came out of prayer, you, you dove in shachrit, they throw your car. <laughs> Hashem, what are you doing? I just came finally to the shul after five years, I didn't wake up, and now they throw my car. That's the test. Do you trust what I promise in the Torah in the long run? Or you want to see an immediate response? There's no immediate response. Why? There's no test. The test is, you listen to me, and you're still not married five years since you became religious. But don't worry, everything is supervised. You still didn't make a million dollars. You're still not sick from your sickness. You're, you're still not healthy from your sickness. Everyone with these problems. All these problems, remember, is a blink of the eye before you realize they'll be over. The question is, what's going to be next? I want to thank everyone that helps, to Simcha and to the Rav and to everyone here for organizing a beautiful afternoon. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, you can ask me now or in person after the lecture. Thank you very much. All the best. <laughs>